Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Lamardo, and I'll be talking to you about accessible forms. It's not as difficult as you think. Um, so let's go ahead into my slides. Um, so again, I'm a senior manager for the design accessibility team at CVS Health. I'm an accessibility advocate and a Vue.js community partner. Um, I do want to call out that my thoughts in this presentation are my own. So with that, let's go into it. Um, so today we're going to be going over how to create accessible forms. We're going to go over inclusive design, um, some of the color considerations, some um, considerations about instructions and labeling in your forms. We're going to be discussing form structures, um, HTML form elements, input types, and autocomplete attributes, as well as um, quickly going over some form validation and how we want to handle our errors inside of our forms. So with that, I do want to get started with a quote from W3C on what accessibility is. So um, web is fundamentally designed to work for all people, whatever their hardware, software, language, location, or ability. So when we're creating accessible content and accessible applications, we're meeting this goal. So in order to do that, we want to make sure that all of our applications and uh, all of our forms inside of our applications are made accessible. So what makes a form accessible? Well, there are a couple of things to consider here. Um, we want to make sure that we're using inclusive design. Um, and we also want to consider the different technologies that can, can be used to navigate our forms. And we want to make sure that it works for everyone. Um, and there are a couple of things that we can do to make sure that that's happening. How do we get started? Well, though it might seem like a lot to take on, there are actually a couple of things to consider that can make it really easy. First, I recommend that you start small and get those easy wins out of the way. Um, I recommend there are always the things that you can do to improve the accessibility of your sites. Um, so go ahead and um, get some of those details here. Um, so here we're going to be talking about how, what inclusive design best practices you can follow to make sure that your designs for your forms are accessible. Once you have an accessible design, we also want to make sure that you're using the correct structure and the right HTML element for the job and, the, and what you're trying to build. Um, the use of good semantics will improve your content structure, which is used by assistive technologies like screen readers uh, to navigate your site. So once you build your form, um, you want to make sure that all of your interactive elements are operable by a keyboard. So make sure that you're testing with your keyboards. And even better yet, turn on your screen reader and try it out. Um, I also recommend that even before you start designing for this, if you have um, inclusive research in place, make sure that you're including people with disabilities to get that feedback right away. So if you use assistive technologies to take your forms, um, that would be fantastic. Let's talk a little bit about some um, design considerations for forms. Um, so first, we're going to be talking about the use of color. So one of the first things I want to say is that color should not be used as the only visual means of conveying any information. Um, here, I've added on the slide a different color wheels displaying different types of color blindness. So all the way to the far left, um, I've added a color wheel displaying all the color hues. And as we move to the right, there's other different color wheels displaying different color blindness. So we've got Deuter <laughs> I'm going to mispronounce a lot of these, so I'm sorry, um, Deuteronopia, protanopia, trichotopia, and the grayscale. Um, so you can see that this shows how different people might perceive these colors and that you should not be relying on color alone to provide any important information because it might be missed. Like with any application, we wanna make sure that we're meeting color contrast. Um, and here I've created a little table that shows all of the WCAG 2.1 standards for color contrast. So to meet color contrast for um, normal size text, your color contrast should be 4.5 to 1 for, to meet AA standards, 7 to 1 to meet AAA standards. And then for large text, which is defined as having four, a point, a 14 point and bold or larger or 18 point or larger, uh, your contrast should be 3 to 1 for, for, to meet AA and then 4.5 to 1 to meet AAA. And of course, across the board, all of your user interfaces should be meeting that 3 to 1 color contrast ratio. And there's a lot of tools that can help you figure out um, whether your colors are accessible. But my favorite tool to use is the WebAIMS Color Contrast Tracker. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up and show you, kind of walk you through how to use this tool. So in here, we have um, two input fields that allow us to um, change the text color and also the background color for 
um, for our test. And as you can see, as I update some of this, we actually, if you navigate a little bit further down on the page, we have different sections. So the first section um, is going to uh, display an example for that normal text with the color combination that you've provided. And then it's going to have um, whether you pass or failed WCAG AA, and then whether you pass or failed WCAG AAA. And all the way to the right of that, um, you will find an example of the colors that you've selected above and what that might look like on the page. You are also going to find um, the same information for large text and the graphical objects and interfaces. So that's anything like any, any icons that you might use or any um, input boxes or anything like that that have that border. If you go further down on this page, they also explain a little bit about um, what this means, how you can use this tool, and um, kind of breaking down the guidelines. So I'm going to go back up a little bit. And um, so I'm going to talk about um, as you're selecting your text color, so I'm going to just change it to another color. I see that all the way to the right, there's a color contrast ratio score. Um, so right now, my score is three to one. Um, and I can see that I'm kind of failing a lot of stuff here. I am passing the graphical object interface. I am failing triple A for large text and both double A and triple A for normal text. So this is definitely a great tool to kind of play around with your color combinations and ensure that whatever colors that you're using are meeting that color contrast and um, is clear and visible for all of our users. But again, you wanna make sure that you're not using color alone to signify um, any important information. So with that, let's go into um, a color demo on how you can use um, Chrome browser to test some of these colors. So I'm actually going to go to the X1 site. So let's go ahead and open that up. Um, so right now I am using Chrome and I really enjoy using Chrome because it allows me a couple of things. Um, so I'm going to grab, uh, I'm gonna hover over one of the headings inside axcon.com and I'm just, uh, well, vq.com slash axcon and I'm gonna go ahead and inspect that header. Once I do that, I'm gonna get the, de the developer tools for Chrome opened up. And I'm actually going to go all the way to the bottom for that styling, uh, for the styles for that, for that element. And I'm going to search for that H2. So if I kind of hover over this, you can see that it's going to be selecting all of the H2s on the page. And it looks like H2s, H3s, H4s, and H5 all have this um, styling applied. And if I open up that color um, selection here next to the color choice, um, I do get this color menu and I kind of get this um, chart that allows me to um, scroll around the different color options and update the colors on the page. So as I kind of move things around, um, I am seeing on the left hand side where the page is, I am seeing those colors update. Um, back into the developer tools, I'm also seeing um, that it's giving me a color contrast ratio score. And as I move the color um, option, I can see that that score is updating. So I'm gonna to try to select something really, really light and hard to see. Uh, on the left, I've selected a white color for my um, headings and it's completely disappeared on the page. And I do see that my color contrast ratio score that um, is displayed here is a one and it does have like a little um, kind of block icon that I know it means that I failed. If I go ahead and ex expand that um, color contrast score, I do see that in the color selection, I get two lines, right? And then I also inside there, I get two different scores. So it's giving me a score for the triple, uh, double A and then the triple A. So it's telling me to meet the double A, I need to have at least 3.0 and for triple A, at least 4.5. So again, as I move my color selection, you can see that all of these are updating and it is telling me when I'm meeting certain things. So I'm gonna go back and say, when I'm not meeting anything and I want the browser to give me a little assistance, let's say that I want to go for that double A um, standard, it does, um, you can use this, their suggested color to fix that color contrast. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that button um, and click on that button and it does kind of update the color selection for me so that I'm at least meeting that double A standard. And I could also do the same for that triple A. Now, if we look towards the right of that, there is kind of like a um, color picker tool that they have here. Um, now this, if you select on that, this will allow you to change the background color um, for this specific test inside this browser. So if, if I wanted to change my background color to this um, and I've selected like a light blue that I found somewhere on the page, um, you can see that that's now not meeting any other color contrast with that gray color that they've um, suggested. So I can go ahead and have them suggest another color and then that will meet the color contrast. 
one thing to call out here is that this is not going to update the colors on the on the site, um, but it is kind of like a nice little neat testing tool for if you want to try out different color combinations inside the browser. So I definitely recommend you try that out if you haven't already done so. Okay, so um, and I've kind of added some instructions here, so you could go to the developers tools, you could inspect an element, open the element styles tab, and then use the color tool to update that color. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, how you want to structure some of your content when it comes to labels and instructions. So when designing, you want to make sure that you're indicating what your required fields are. Um, this will help prevent uh, pe prevent people from submitting any the form with without um, supplying the correct information. I also want to spend some time here talking about mental models and how um, some users might see a lot of um, our, our inputs and say, hey, I'm just going to get right into the form and start filling it out. If they're asking for it, they absolutely need it. So I'm just going to fill it out. So that's another consideration. If you're asking for information and you have a lot of optional fields, why are those optional fields there? Why, why are you asking information that might be optional for the user? And maybe you might want to provide some information as to why you might require some of that data or how that might be useful for you to collect. Another call out is to always avoid um, hiding text. And I wanna say like, if it's useful for anybody, we wanna make sure that it's available for anybody to access it. So by hiding some content, you're actually making it inaccessible for some people. We also wanna make sure that our instructions are clear. We wanna make sure that we're using clear and plain language that can be understood by every, everyone. And if we are using anything like abbreviations, that we're expanding those abbreviations upon first use. We also want to make sure that every single input field has a descriptive label. Um, that way, um, it's semantically paired um, for assistive technologies, and then um, visual users can definitely see that relationship. We also want to make sure that the use of labels, any labels and instructions, are staying close to the input field. That way, we're again reinforcing that relationship between um, the helper text, labels, and the input field. And we want to make sure that we're not using placeholders to provide any important information for our users. There are a couple of different problems with placeholders, um, one being that it's not really recognized and picked up by all assistive technologies the same way. And also, as the users are typing into that input field, that placeholder will disappear, and then they're going to be missing that content. And we're going to go over an example of how this can be an issue in a bit. I also want to call out that we want to make sure that we're using appropriate semantics to programmatically pair this information inside of our fields, um, and we'll discuss this in a bit. So let's go over some examples. So the first example I have is a required um, form field, well, a, a form that has some required fields. Um, so I've opened up this code pen and it says required fields, and then the instructions on top of the form says, red fields are required. And then one of, I have two fields in here, one says first name, the other one says last name. And the first name has kind of like a red border around it. And that's the only indication that I have that that field is required. Now, as we've mentioned before, we might want to, we will want to stay away from doing this kind of pattern because um, not this color is not going to be recognized by everyone. So we want to make sure that we're not doing something like this. Instead, um, we can indicate required fields like this. So in this one, we have, um, and again, the same kind of example, we have a first name and last name um, fields. And then we have all fields are required unless marked optionals. And then we have the first name and then the last name has an optional um, inside the label. So we could see that this is a lot clearer for the user. Um, in my mental model, I know that, hey, I'm gonna get in, start filling this out. And then whenever I see that optional, I know that I can skip it instead of um, assuming that nothing is required. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, what it means for form fields to be required. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my developers tools here. So um, you can actually do this. And in fact, I'll do it like this. I'm going to right click into one of the um, input fields and I'm going to inspect. And then I'm going to check out that I actually have a couple of attributes inside this input field. So in the first name input field, I see that it's a type of text so that users can input text. Um, it is um, paired with that label for first name. Um, and then I have ARIA required equals true as well as required. So 
if I have um, ARIA required and required, um, that will kind of have um, the required attribute will kind of enable some of the browsers um, built in functionality to block some of those um, from being submitted. So if I'm trying to submit my form with a required field that is empty, um, I'm going to get this browser um, error message that says, please fill out this field. So when I try to submit that form, it, the browser kind of picks this up and provides that message. It's not something that I've that I've provided. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen reader to show you what that looks like. To enable R selected speaker last name optional edit text first name required invalid data edit text. You are current. So I see that the first name is a required they, it's a required field. And we're going to just hit um, enter so that the form submits. Please fill out this field. So that please fill out this field message happened because the browser handled that error message because I did add that um, attribute of required um, so that it's blocked by the browser and not it doesn't allow the user to submit. Voice over off. Um, I can, however, if I were to remove that required attribute and leave the ARIA required true, let's see what that experience is like. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my screen reader again. Voice over. To enable screen reader support, press main tool. And I now do want, in required field. I do want to say that I am using VoiceOver inside of Chrome, so that's the combination that I'm using here. Pause button. Leap last name, first name, required. Edit text. So even though I move, so we just heard that it said first name required. Even though I moved the required attribute, because I have the ARIA required, the screen reader and assistive technologies can still pick up that it is a required field. However, I'm going to try to submit this form and see what happens. So I'm just going to hit enter. Frame zero. So I know that it kind of over off. everything disappeared because I'm in CodePen, but it did allow me to submit that form and it did go through the browser, didn't block me. Um, and then I, because I haven't created any custom messaging, um, it did allow that kind of submission to go through. So that is kind of one little caveat of um, the difference between adding ARIA, um, ARIA required and, and not having that required attribute inside your input field. Okay, so let's go back and then we'll, we'll go into a little bit more uh, deeper into form validations um, later in the session. But first, I want to talk about accessible naming. Um, so we want to make sure that all, uh, all of our information is being picked up by assistive technologies. And we can do that um, by ensuring that everything is properly named and paired with the information that is on the page. And there are a couple of ARIA attributes that can help us add certain um, specific or, or kind of dive deeper into the LM, uh, accessible names that we can give our elements. So let's discuss um, a couple of options that we have here. So we have an ARIA attribute called ARIA label, and this will um, allow us to provide any essential information about an object. And it kind of allows us to give any name we want to, a, to an element. We want to be careful with how we use that though. And this is really, really great for um, things like icons or something, or, or when we're using um, icons that are functional, right? Like functional icons. Um, and we also wanna make sure that when we're providing this names for these icons, we wanna make sure that the names are matching the functionality that they symbolize. One example is we might have a little trash can icon that deletes some information. We might not, even though it's a trash can, we might not wanna call it a trash can because that's not really meaningful for our users. We might wanna say delete. Delete might be a better name for something like that. Next, we have ARIA label by. So this is similar to ARIA label, except that it grabs, um, it establishes a relationship between different objects on the page and you compare these objects by ID. Um, so it, it's kind of like grabbing content that's already on the page and pulling that to grab, uh, to create an accessible name for another element that's on the page. Um, and, you can, and you can actually grab multiple pieces of content to string together one descriptive name. Again, you wanna be careful making sure that um, things remain um, accessible for everyone, right? Like we don't want to grab things that are all over the page and they're not visible, visibly available and clear for everyone. Next, we have ARIA described by. Now this doesn't necessarily provide or overwrite accessible names for the element, but it does provide additional information that the user might need. And again, just like ARIA labeled by, this is going to be paired um, with by ID to other elements on the page. And this is specifically useful for pairing things like helper text or any instructions on the page, as well as any error messages that might pop up um, for, for any given input field. So let's go into some examples for this. So the first examples is gonna have some instructions. 
So the first example has, um, it, it's, it's kind of like a discouraged pattern <laughs> um, and it is a placeholder pattern. So in here, I have an input field for my name and then it says inside the input field with a placeholder text, it says first and last name. So I know that I have to input my first and last name to submit this form. So I'm gonna go ahead and start typing something. So I'm gonna write my first name, Maria. And then let's say I get a phone call. Okay, I'm gonna go answer that phone call. I step away, I come back to my form. I'm like, okay, where was I? Actually, yeah, I see that I have a field that says that has a label for name. I'm actually done here. I'm gonna move on. So I've already missed the information that the placeholder had that I actually needed to include my last name. Um, so this is why it's important to provide those instructional um, notes outside of the input field that are a little bit more permanent that placeholder allows us to have. Another option to provide um, some of the instructional, um, some of the instructions for your input fields are inline, inline instructions inside your label. So in this example, I have name and then in parentheses, I have first and last. So if I'm starting to fill out this form, I know that I have to fill out my first and last name in order to submit this form, because that's the information that they're asking. Alternatively, we can also use ARIA, ARIA described by. Um, so in this example, I have an input field and then the label for that is name. And then underneath that input field, I have first and last name as a helper text. And as I'm filling this out, again, I'm not gonna miss that information um, and it is going to be paired. Um, I'm going to go ahead and refresh this, and I do want to test this out. I want to walk you through how this experience is with my screen reader. Voice speaker notes app to enable screen. So I'm going to go to the first one that had the placeholders first. Now in instruction, enter in code and in submit name first and last name. Edit text. So it did say it did say name first and last name. So it kind of just kind of did it all in one one round, right? So it read the label and the placeholder all in one. Um, and as I start typing this, a L, leaving code pet, entering Maria, content selected, name, edit text. If I re-enter that input field, I hear that the content is Maria and I hear that the label is name, but I the placeholder is gone. I no longer have access to this. So I, I, I lost that information. Um, so let's move down into that inline example where I have the instructions inside the label. Submit name, first and last, edit text. A -O -A -M -A -O -O. Submit Maria Lamardo, content selected, name, first and last, so um, as you heard, as I typed in my name and I went back into the input field, I heard Maria Lamardo, I heard the label, which is name first and last. So I didn't lose any information. I can, it's still very clear to me what I was supposed to do. Um, now inside the ARIA, the ARIA described by, it's gonna be a little bit different. Submit name, edit text, first and last name, you are. So I just paused the screen reader there, but um, I heard that it said, name text field right or edit text and then and then it got followed by the descriptive text so first and last name so it's it kind of takes a pause in between and then describes uh, adds the description at the end so um whether you want it inside the label or as a aria described by um it does have a little bit of a different experience but it is semantically paired and, and um creating that, relationship, creating that relationship for assistive technologies i'm also going to just quickly show you what this looks like um inside the Chrome DevTools. So I just went ahead and inspected this. So I, as you can see, I have an input field um, that has an ARIA described by attribute. And the value for that attribute is the same. I, it's matching the ID for um, where I have my helper text. So that's how we're creating that relationship. All right, so let's go back to our other example um, for the rest of ARIA labels, for the rest of the ARIA labels. So in here, I have both types. I have, ARIA, I have an example for both ARIA label and ARIA label by. Um, now I'm gonna go into a couple of different things here. Um, so I'm actually going to view it. Yeah, actually this is good. Um, view it in the editor so I can give you a different perspective here. I'm gonna open it in debug mode. Okay, so in this in this view, we have an ARIA label example where we have a search input field um, and that visible label has been removed. Um, however, maybe uh, because it is a search field, I have that little um, like magnifying glass icon that, signif that is kind of a universal icon for search. And um, let me just inspect that really quick. So I've actually provided an ARIA label for that button. Um, and in fact, because I, I am using um, like a class to add this 
to add this icon, I cannot give it an alt text. So I have provided an ARIA label for that button to provide that naming. So inside my Chrome DevTools, I can actually go underneath um, some of these tabs and there is a tab for accessibility. Now in here, we're gonna find things like the accessibility tree, um, any ARIA attributes that have been added for that specific element, and also um, any computer properties that might have been added. I wanna focus in the computer properties. In the computer properties, we're gonna find um, our name for the specific element. And again, I'm selecting the button that has the search, the search icon. So we can see that um, in here it says the name is search. And I see that there is no, no value for ARIA label by. However, I am seeing a value for ARIA label, which is equal to search. And this is where the accessible name is coming from. If we take a look at our second example, which looks pretty identical, except that there is a visible search label in this one. I'm going to go ahead and inspect that button. And it is structured very similarly. Um, however, inside the name, inside the name computer properties under the accessibility tab inside the Chrome DevTools, I am seeing that there is an ARIA label guy. And then that's grabbing um, that information from the label with the ID for search label. So that's kind of how you can create these relationships and abstracting some of this um, content that's already on the page to create those accessible names. One thing I want to call out, let's say that I went back to my first example um, that had the ARIA label. Um, how, what happens if I had both ARIA label and the ARIA label by attributes at the same time? So let's, let's take a look at that. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead in and give my H1 an ID just for testing. This You shouldn't do this, <laughs> but I'm just going to give this um, header an ID of test. That way I could use that heading to give this button an accessible name. So I'm going to say ARIA label by, and I'm going to say that the label by should be paired with that test. So if I look in the accessibility tab, I see that the name for this element has now been updated to ARIA labels, which is the, the value of my H1 header. Um, and then you can see that it has an ARIA label. It's being grabbed to that ID of test, with ha which has the value of ARIA labels. And it is actually overriding the ARIA label that I've provided manually. So here you can see that the ARIA label that does have a value because it does say search has been crossed out, meaning that assistive technology is actually going to pick up on the um, ARIA labeled by if both are provided. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen reader to show you what that looks like. Voice over. Chrome busy, busy. ARIA lab search, ARIA labels button. So I just tap into that search button um, that I've given, that I've paired with my header. So the, the, what my screen reader is reading out loud is ARIA labels. Um, so that's just one big call out. Voice over off. Another thing I want to call out on this example, and one another example on how you might want to use ARIA labels is um, inside here, I actually have two forms, and I've given both forms a role of search because I have I want the, to create these as landmarks on my page. And let's say that um, both of these are searches that have different functionalities inside my site. Let's say that one of the searches is kind of like my site-wide search inside my, my, my navigational banner. Um, and then inside my banner, inside the navigation, right? Um, and then the other one might be like, oh, inside this page, I might want to look for things like my accounts or something like that, or movie titles. <laughs> um, so we might have different um, needs for this. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen reader, open up my rotor tool to look at the landmarks available to me. Voice up. Now, articles menu, window, links, form, web landmarks menu. You are currently in a voiceover menu. This is a list of closing right, landmarks menu. Again. Search, Didn't... edit, tech, landmarks menu. Okay. No items in, no so... item, landmarks menu. No items in, landmarks menu. No item, landmark. Okay, so here I have two landmarks and I can see that they're both search and search. Search, search, search. And um, this is not great. This is not a great experience because I have no idea why there are two searches on the page. What what is the difference between these two searches? Um, so one great Voice way, overall. one great way to use ARIA labels is to even provide um, unique names for those um, landmarks. So I'm going to go ahead onto the first um, row equals search, which is creating that landmark, and I'm going to say this is an ARIA label for site-wide 
and I cannot spell site-wide search or site-wide because it's gonna know that it is a search. And then um, I'll just give the second one. I'm gonna just say that it's like looking for accounts. So I'm just gonna say accounts. So with that updated, so I've um, edited the alt text for those, the, not the alt text, the ARIA label for those. Voiceover on Chrome led to enable screen reader support. Search, edit text, landmarks menu. So now I'm gonna go over the two landmarks that I have available again. Search, edit, landmarks menu, site-wide search, account search, site-wide search, escape button, search, edit text, voiceover off. So that was a lot better for me as a user to understand what the difference between those two landmarks might be and why I might want to use one over the other. Okay, so now that we've talked about um, the use of accessible naming, let's talk a little bit about form structure and some of the technical considerations for forms. So um, HTML form elements can be used to create forms for, for um, kind of grabbing user input, collecting user input. And forms can contain many different elements. They can have input, labels, select, um, text areas, buttons, field sets, legends, and so on. Um, so we're gonna go over a couple of these in the next slide. Um, so I do wanna go over some of the form controls um, that are available to us. Um, in this first example, I have a, a, a checkbox or checkboxes. Um, and it does say select your snacks. And then my options are granola bar, mixed nuts, apple slices, or popcorn. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and right click on this and inspect the tool and in inspect this element to see how it's kind of structured. So on the dev, in, the dev, in the Chrome DevTools, I see that there is a field set that kind of holds that entire group grouping together. Inside that field set that's creating that relationship, we have a legend. The legend is the select your snacks um, content that is kind of providing me with a prompt on what exactly I'm trying to answer here. And then inside each of those, then I have an input field with their corresponding label. So each checkbox, it's actually its own input field with, a with input type of checkbox. And then that is of course, programmatically paired with the, with the corresponding label. And then we see that all around. I'm gonna go ahead and select this input field that has the type of checkbox. I'm going to open up the accessibility tab inside my Chrome DevTools. I'm just gonna collapse everything other than um, the computer properties. So we've talked a little bit about the naming computer property, but I do wanna talk about some of the other things we're seeing in here. Um, for this specific input, we see this new role, role value of checkbox. So I know that assistive technology is gonna grab this element and recognize it as a checkbox because of the way that it was built. I also know that this element also has other attributes like properties available to it. I can now track whether the input is invalid um, from the user. I can, now, I can now see that it is a focusable element and I can also see that it, it can be checked, right? Um, so let me go ahead and, and, and kind of start interacting with that. So as I interact with one of the elements and I inspect it again, ooh, let's see, let's move to another one. Um, and I inspect it, I do see that once I check it, it does move um, that check state and those updated to be true. So um, let me go ahead and show you my screen reader experience. Voice over on to enable screen reader, to enable screen reader banner, speech, visited link, entering granola bar, uncheck, gran mixed nuts, granola bar, leaving code, entering code and form controls frame, granola bar, uncheck checkbox, select your snacks group. So I heard granola bar, unchecked checkbox. So I know it's a checkbox that has not been checked. And then it also says select your snack, which is kind of referencing that legend that I have inside my field set. So you can see how all of this is kind of coming together to give me that experience and really letting me know what type of input I'm interacting here, what the state for that input is. And if I go ahead and check it. Checked, granola bar, checkbox. It does update me and tell me, hey, this has been checked. And these are all of the same properties that we were able to see from inside the Chrome DevTools inside that accessibility tab. Voice over off. So if you don't have an assistive technology available for you to test, I really, really recommend you open up your dev tools and start playing around with those computer properties. Start, if you're trying to have different implementations of things, definitely check that out and see that you're having all of the semantics available for assistive technologies. Um, a very similar experience is available for um, 
radio buttons. So I'm going to go ahead and inspect the radio buttons to show you what that kind of structure is like. Um, for radio buttons, I also see a field set. Inside that field set, I have a legend. And inside there, I also have multiple input fields with their corresponding labels. And instead, um, the only difference here is that instead of saying um, input type of checkbox, I have input type of radio. Um, and if we look at our accessibility tab here in the Chrome DevTools, well, let me just pull this up so it's a little bit easier to read. Okay. Um, if I open up my accessibility tab, I am seeing um, that the role is not a checkbox, but it is now a radio. And of course, this is important because not only does it, um, it's not only is it giving different information, but it also will have different keyboard functionality. So with, with checkboxes, um, I can enter the, the checkbox with the tab key and go through each specific individual checkbox as I tap through and using um, the, end, the space bar um, to check or uncheck, where in the radio buttons, I can tab to the radio button group and if I tab again, I'm actually going to leave the radio buttons. So I'm actually going to be using my arrow keys to navigate through the different option selections inside the, um, the radio buttons. So when you're when you're creating this type of um, elements, you want to make sure that you're using semantic elements because they already have all of these built in functionality in here. And you want to make sure that you're definitely taking advantage of everything that kind of comes free as you're building it. Um, and then the, I want to go over this example for select menu. Um, in here, I have uh, a question that says, which is your favorite food? And in the drop down, I have tacos, macaroni and cheese, hamburgers, or sushi. Um, and as I inspect this element, this one is different than the checkbox and radio button. Um, so in here, I have a, a label for a select element. Um, so that the select element kind of creates that drop down. And then inside the select element, I will have my different options. So these options are what I what I have access to when I select that drop dropdown. Um, so the, this is built a little bit differently, but we want to make sure that we are having that label paired correctly with that select element, and then having the options for that um, drop down inside the select element. Okay. So next, let's go into. Um, there are also different input types that you can have. So um, we talked a little bit about checkbox, radio, but there are things like passwords, text, email, um, phone, right? Tel telephone, time. Um, so I'm not definitely not going to go over all of these today, but you can see that there's a lot of different options that you can have. Um, one thing to consider as you're selecting the type, the input type is consider the mobile experience. And I'm talking about mobile web specifically. Um, as you're selecting these different input types, it can trigger different, uh, different um, keyboards to pop up on your mobile devices. So if you have, um, in this slide, I have different examples. So for input type of text, I'm going to get a keyboard that has kind of like the alphabet, right? If I have input type of color, I'm going to get this color selection tool um, when I select that input. If I have input type of number, I'm going to get a keyboard that has uh, the numbers available. And that's different from input type of telephone, where it's going to get a keyboard that has the numbers, but also letters so that I could type um, if, if the phone number is kind of having that format. So let's talk a little bit about input assistance uh, considerations. Um, so you want to make sure that you're providing user suggestions for corrections whenever possible. Um, and then you also want to help them avoid errors by making it faster for people to fill out their forms. So you can try, you can help by setting the correct auto autocomplete attributes to each input field. Um, and then I've provided a list of all of the input fields, um, all of the autocomplete attributes available for each input field. So I'm going to go ahead and jump over to that site. So this kind of talks about the input fields, um, the autocomplete for each input field and what the, their value should be based on the functionality. So in here, I see something like name. I might have autocomplete equals to name if I want the user to provide their full name or a given name if I want their first name, family name if I only want their last name, and so on. So there's a lot of different autocomplete attributes that you can provide so that any data that's stored in your browser can be automatically populated for the user and they don't have to spend time going through each specific input for to provide that information. And my final section for the day will be form validation. Um, so helping users fix their errors through some of the guidance that we'll be providing. And why might we want to validate? 
Well, we want to make sure that we are getting the right data in the right format. So um, we it, it won't work properly if our users' data is stored in the incorrect format, uh, and we might have um, we might have um, data that's incorrect, or they might omit information once that data is submitted. We also want to protect our users. Uh, forcing our users to enter secure passwords will make it easier to protect their accounts. And of course, we want to protect ourselves. Uh, we want to make sure that we are kind of blocking any malicious um, users from misusing and protected forms um, to harm our applications. So let's talk a little bit about error handling. We want to make sure that, again, you're providing descriptive error messages when an error is detected. For long forms, you can add a list, a list of links at the top of the page. Um, that way people can um, fix the errors once they submit the forms and kind of jump into those error input fields that have those errors. And we also want to announce any errors with ARIA Life regions. And we want to, um, if we have uh, a password, a list of password requirements, we want to make sure that we're announcing when all of those criteria are met when it's a long list. So for ARIA Life regions, um, to announce any non-interactive content as, as it appears on the page, you can use ARIA Life regions. So one of them is ARIA Life equals assertive, which kind of updates announcements and it interrupts the user right away. So if something pops on the page, this is important. I'm going to block what you're doing and tell you right away. Um, whereas we have ARIA Polite, which updates once um, your screen reader or assistive technology has completed going over the content that it's currently on. So it's, it's more polite. <laughs> And then the default is are your life off where, where it, um, any content will not get announced. So let's jump into our um, final example here. So I'll, um, I've already discussed um, how the required fields are handled differently based on ARIA required or required input um, attribute. But in here, I have a simple form that asks me for my first name, last name, email, phone number. I have a radio button that asks me whether this is a mobile phone number. I have a drop down that's asking me for my preferred ways to shop. And then it's asking me to fill uh, to create a new password. And then it does have a list of requirements for having a password that is at least eight characters long, has at least one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, one number, and one special character. And as I'm filling this out, I want to make sure that we're not triggering any errors as users are tabbing through the page or tabbing through the inputs. Let's say that somebody wants to kind of navigate and see what they're about to be asked on the page. We want to make sure that we're not triggering any errors just because they're tabbing through. Any errors should be announced if I started interacting with something. So I'm just going to put 23 for my first name and then leave that input field. Um, now I can see that error where it says, hey, only alphabetical characters must be used. And if I inspect that error message, I see that it is a list of errors. And then I have an ARIA Life light, which will announce it as soon as I leave that input field. Quick little call out here for developers. If you're using um, a framework or something like that, where you're looping through any customized um, error messages that you've provided, make sure that you're not creating empty list, list items, because then assistive technology is going to grab it and say, you're on error one out of three when there's actually one error being displayed in there. So I'm using Vue to loop through this um, unique error custom messages. And I've actually looped inside a span and then it's creating the listed item when something is available. So just a little tip. And then my final thing I want to talk about is um, as I'm entering um, a password. So because I have um, the autocomplete attribute, you saw that um, I have a recommendation for like one of my safe passwords in here. This is completely fake. Um, but one thing is that if I select that, I can also move into that toggle button to um, see that password. I can move back. I can copy that password and move it into the confirmed password. So one thing I want to call out is that we don't want to block any copy pasting in any of our input fields. Um, all right, I definitely um, recommend that you kind of get into this form and play around with it. Look at how um, the, the password requirements are paired to the input fields. Look at how the errors for the password uh, input fields are being announced um, so that you can get a better idea of how you can handle that on your site. With that, um, I know we have a couple of minutes left for Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer that now. 
Maria, this has been fantastic first, just seeing the examples of how it impacts a user um, using voiceover and then just, you know, best practices and everything, actually physically being able to walk through it and see it has been really great. And we get a lot of good feedback um, from the audience. Um, we only have a few minutes for questions, so um, make sure you upload the ones that you really want to see. Um, but the first question that we have is, do you have a recommendation for or against using an asterisk um, as an indicator for required fields? Yeah, you can definitely use that. Make sure that um, you're not kind of leaving it as an asterisk by itself. Um, you might even want to either, so like you might have a message on top of the form field that says any any anything that has an asterisk is a required field or some message of that sort, and then have those um, indicated inside your input fields. Um, that is fine. I do like to kind of flip that around since mental models do. Research will show that mental model for users are kind of to get into the form and start filling it out as soon as possible. Um, so then they kind of assume that everything that we're asking them is required. So if we're asking them, there's a reason for it, they're just gonna fill it out. So I do like to call out optional fields instead that way they know that what they can skip. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Okay, excellent. And then in your experience for date input fields, is it better to have a single text field for, you know, month, like MM, you know, forward slash day, day, forward slash year, 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 or three separate fields for month, date, and year? Definitely one input field. Um, and dates can get really tricky because what are you asking your user specifically? Are you asking them for their birthday where they might um, just be able to really quick enter that date? Or are you asking them to select from like a range of available dates? Um, in which case we might want to use a different type of input field. So definitely consider what, um, what your purpose is for asking that information. What would be the easiest for the user to fill out that information and keep track of like, if you're having a date field where you're like, might have any blackout dates or something like that, maybe the text input might not be the best choice. Sure, yep. Okay, and then how can you test the form with a screen reader when the form is in the design phase, such as like in Sketch? Well, I would definitely at that point recommend that, um, you know, you're working with that your designers are working closely with um, either developers or if you have um, accessibility experts within your team to make sure that your designs are being built in a way that it can be supported by um, implementation best practices. Um, but keep in mind everything that we've kind of discussed in the session that you have visible labels that um, any that you're not using placeholders to provide any crucial information for users. You might have like an email example in there, but make sure that you're providing the formatting rules or any 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 rules that you want for that format outside that input field that is permanently visible. Um, that way. Well, it's, it's not even about permanently visible, but as we saw in this example, when we use placeholder, even with screen readers, when I go back into that field after it's been filled out, that information is gone. Um, so that's definitely something to consider in the design phase as well. So how it's it's really important to kind of understand like how this stuff works in the browser because it does impact how we want to design for this for this forms. Yep, makes total sense. Um, do you have any guidelines for helper text? Like, should it always be used if the field label is descriptive enough? Uh, not necessarily. That's a that's a great question. So if the if it's a pretty straightforward um, field like name, you might not need uh, right like this helper text for that. But um, things like like you said, like let's say that we're asking for a birthday, we might want to have that format for that date underneath that input field so that it's clear for the users what type of data they might provide. Like um, that way they're providing the, the right amount of characters and the right format. That way, when we do get it on our back end, we can store it properly. Okay, excellent. And then is it okay to use CSS to hide a form field that does not pass accessibility, for example? Um, a third party embedded form that's not totally compliant. Ooh, is it, I would recommend um, to just remove it if possible, um, just remove it completely. There are certain CSS rules that you can implement to hide some content, um, which is okay in some situ situations. Um, however, I, I highly recommend deleting any any piece of code that you're not going to be using at all from your applications because um, you know, things update really quick and that might be available for some users and it can be very, very confusing depending on like how things evolve in the, in, in the browsers or even inside assistive technology and how, how things get supported. 
Um, so definitely try to just delete anything that's not used instead of hiding it. Okay, excellent. Yep. And then kind of similar to the questions around date, um, like date formatting, is it best practice to have three fields or one field for a phone number? Oh, I would say one field. Uh -huh. okay. Speaking of uh, something I've seen on the web, um, I've seen places that have phone numbers in three different fields. And then as you're typing, they will automatically tab for you. So that auto tabbing, and that can be so confusing because like as you're typing, then you're kind of moving. And if you have like the label for that input field, then it already starts like reading a new label where like you haven't even tabbed yourself or like if, even if that's not the case, let's say that you're a keyboard user, you're typing your numbers, you yourself might tab to enter that next field, right? So that you can continue writing your numbers. So definitely don't do anything that is unexpected for users or isn't part of like normal uh, functionality inside your browser. to so kind of get that function. Um, definitely, I would recommend one input field for phone numbers and then just have the right formatting uh, instructions for your users. Excellent. Well, we are out of time, guys. I'm so sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but Maria, this has been fabulous. We greatly appreciate um, this presentation, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the AxCon. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Emily. Bye, everyone. Thank you.